Hello, everyone, and thank you very much for for the opportunity that Nana Temper gives us to present part of our work and uh, the research that we do here in uh, Kuopio at Kuopio Center for Gene and Cell Therapy, located in Finland, 400 kilometers north from uh, from Helsinki. Um, I would like to introduce first a little bit the company. Uh, so that was established in 2017, uh, sprouted from theme vector research and development team and the company itself in vector has been basically in the field of gene therapy for the past 25 years so a lot of accumulated experience there KCT currently it's uh, having 40 employees we are in the process of growing it also 12 PhDs and a bunch of enthusiastic and dedicated uh, scientific teams there the company was formed by uh, world uh, leader on the gene and, uh, the, and the gene therapy, and it's Professor Sepola Hertuala from the University of Eastern Finland. I mean, back in 2001, already with the company Arc Therapeutics, he was already in phase three trials for glioblastoma, and a number of gene therapy products in the pipeline since then for ovarian cancer, glioblastoma again, and uh, ischemic uh, models, a bit more challenging when it comes to gene therapy, but nevertheless attempting those too. Uh, currently, Heiki Borikoski acts as a managing director for KCT, and Dr. Tujerke Karainen is the scientific director of the center. A little bit of KCT overview and how, how it interacts with FinVector. Essentially, KCT is right in the middle between the collaborators, academic or other organizations, which would uh, have interesting candidates that could become actually gene or cell therapy products. And those are basically transferred or studied further by KCT, where we construct and design vectors and generate them. We work a lot on the analytical and manufacturing development of those candidates in order to reach to a stage where you can actually produce batches for preclinical studies and with that proof of principle move forward to then talks and GMP the appropriate phases uh, depending on the product. So this is a little bit the setup that we have between KCT and FinVector and the goal is to develop yeah next future generation therapeutics the the center it's located in the Kuopio campus in a number of companies a very interactive area um, there's uh, also the university hospital so that's a very interesting collaboration also for moving forward into some of the trials that we try to do and uh, besides that we are actually um, having access to a lab animal center and uh, excellent biomedical imaging unit, um, which contains uh, uh, top um, capabilities. Now going a bit more into the field itself of uh, gene and cell therapy, this is taken from the Alliance of, for Regenerative Medicine. And it was just to point out that this year, H1 2021, already more than $40 billion have been raised for the field, beating the record for for sure at the end of this year, beating the record of past years. And also for the first time, cell-based immuno-oncology products have, um, immuno-oncology interest have raised more money than gene therapy per cell. So altogether, a uh, very interesting area and future for gene and cell therapy at the moment. Going to the gene transfer uh, technologies and the vectors used for gene therapy clinical trials, um, there is a list probably outdated already with the number of clinical trials that are going, but the arrows indicate the three vectors that we use for our uh, trials and it's adenoviruses, is lentiviruses, and adeno-associated viruses. 
So altogether in Coapio we have, <coughs> excuse me, capacity to produce the three of them. Down below is the table with the differences between those vectors. You go from the smaller AAVs to larger adenos and lentiviruses, whether envelope or not. I mean, the stability, for example, for lentiviruses is a big issue due to the presence of envelope and some characteristics of these vectors. Um, essentially, FIM vector already is in phase three to commercial approval for adenoviral drug products, and KCT works with the three of them in the early phase development for clinical trials, either improved versions or other targets. When talking about viral vectors and, and their use in gene therapy, you would have two essential approaches, which would be either ex vivo or in vivo. In ex vivo, the dominant vector would be lentivirus, and essentially you would use that by either obtaining cells from donors in the allogeneic models or from patients, and then using your lentivirus in order to transduce those cells and introduce your payload into those, integrate them, amplify that population and deliver them to the patients. Whereas in the in vivo approaches, either by local injection or systemic injection, you will put directly your vectors into the patients. And a number of products already approved in the market and certainly more to come uh, soon. I wanted to talk in this this session basically about AAV and, um, and and the problems that we have actually encountered when producing AAV. Uh, AAV occurs naturally in different serotypes. Essentially, here is the picture where you have the wild type and the rep of cap genes are removed and converted into a different cassette which has a promoter and a transgene and with the help of uh, helping plasmids, if I could say like that, the functions of REP and CAP are delivered to the same cell as the transgene for the production of the of the recombinant vector. Besides the naturally occurring serotypes, the table on the right also is to illustrate a little bit that a number of engineering techniques are used in order to produce novel AVs. Uh, vectors that are capable of either targeting the specific tissues or even to try to evade one of the problems with AAV, which is the detection by the immune system. So a plethora of chimeric and mosaic capsids um, around uh, for, for the field of AAV. When going to bioprocessing and the production of the vector itself, essentially, Upstream teams would um, thaw and span the master cell banks or the working cell banks. We currently work, we work with bioreactors. Obviously, the initial um, experiments or development are, it's done in flasks, but we work mostly with bioreactors. And there, your cells basically will be transfected with the required plasmids. And after a given period of time, you would basically break the cells in order to release the AVs, treat those harvest with nucleases to remove contaminant nucleic acids, and then that is the harvest that goes to downstream processing where essentially you clarify the last harvest and then you capture and polish the target recombinant the AV so that you can reach to the final step of concentration and diafiltration into selected buffer uh, in order to obtain your uh, drug substance, which then you can still filter and proceed to fill and finish to reach the desired drug product. In KCT, we work with productions from three to 180 liters for AV, and we do it in uh, bioreactors and in other end mode. And some of the challenges that we have been having when trying to reach uh, good titers at the end for those uh, batches and good quality has been the 
separation of full and empty capsids, which per se is challenging, but depending on the transgene, particularly the size of the transgene can be even more challenging, at least in our hands. And then the problems with aggregation. Um, this has been one of the main bottlenecks that we have encountered. And, uh, and I will talk about that. So during formulation or during uh, early process development, it's key to select the appropriate buffers. And mostly because you want to understand what is the effect of your buffer versus the parameters that you're using when developing the scalable platforms and be able to dissociate those in order to optimize them accordingly. As I mentioned, process development, we have to do it in scalable models. At the end of the day, you want to go to larger scales to produce enough drug product. <coughs> and it would be extremely expensive and slow if you wanted to screen multiple buffers uh, using those scalable models. In our case, we started with a selected final formulation buffer, and we had the restrictions due to the indication that we were working we were working with and the target tissue that the uh, recombinant baby was going to be used for. And uh, yeah, mostly was related to the strength, ionic strength, conductivity and osmolality of our final formulation buffer and the type of salts that we could, could not use and the ranges and concentrations of those salts. Essentially, what we ended up is seeing that we had problem with aggregation in the final step of ultrafiltration, and in turn, that yield very important losses in sterile filtration. So we needed to work on solving that problem, and uh, yeah, then is when we got in touch with Nanotemper, and we decided that we wanted to try. Uh, their technologies and see if that could help in speeding up development. But we chose to study thermal and colloidal stability. We have done it for AV, but also we do it for adenoviruses. And we use it during process development using the newest equipment that um, beginning of the year was, or well, end of past year was launched by Nanotempa. So we were looking for something suitable that in earlier stage, it would allow us high throughput screening and uh, that's what we used it for. A little bit of the strategy that we used at the beginning, it was to dilute or create dilution series of chromatography purified vectors and put them into different multiple buffers to control concentration. And then studying the stability of those preparations after conditioning them in different manners. None of these are sterile filtered or were sterile filtered precisely because we are looking for the aggregation issues. Um, we were using high grade, high grade capillaries and high precision reads that the machine allowed with samples in triplicate. We used also same approach with products that were eluted actually on, on different chromatography buffers. So one step above the, the actual formulation. And finally, once we did uh, pre-selection of candidates, we went, we moved to a standard scalable uh, formulation in scaled down models with the selected buffers. And finally, the analysis of products that we obtain once subjected to different stresses and storage conditions. So this was a little bit the whole um, line that we applied there using Panta. This is the first screen we did as part of a demo trial, actually, before the equipment was launched. Uh, we delivered samples and Nanotemper kindly I agreed to collaborate and um, do a test trial on those ones. So what we did there was basically observe the, the standard buffer that we were using against the selection of other buffers and see how this technology or if this technology would allow us to <coughs> go faster into and here i would probably say that is rather than choosing the best candidate which can be also obtained there is at the beginning for, for us it was more to eliminate those that clearly are no-go candidates and that is per se also saving so much effort that it's it's really worth to have that technology 
So we were convinced and we purchased the equipment and we once we had it Q1 this year, we basically went back to the analysis, analysis of those buffers, now with the equipment in our hands and these buffers. And here's to show a little bit of the data. I'll be referring to buffers by the name A, B, C, D, B being the one that we were traditionally using. And here are just another three candidates. We were looking for DLS using Panta, a very, very small amount of, of product, and that was really, really good. And select actually based on initially the cumulant, the total cumulant and uh, the polydispersity of the, of the sample, selecting the candidates that could be the best. We also tried self-interaction analysis on the right side in order to correlate or see the, the, the correlation that we see with the DLS once we plotted in terms of KDs. And we selected uh, buffer A uh, clearly over the original uh, buffer that we were using. With that, we moved to, as I mentioned, first in one step above ultra filtration, whether different ionic strength on our pollution buffers from chromatography could have an impact in the process. And we tried a couple of them. You can see the difference in terms of thermostability for, for the virus. Well, eventually what we realized that there was no difference when they were actually combined with the final formulation buffer. So it was only due to the final buffer, the problems that we were seeing. Then this is the slide where the results for the scale down, now scalable TFF formulation runs. Looks like uh, we did uh, two identical runs with the two buffers. Uh, again, no sterile filtration on these samples. And you can see that the thermostability for the buffer A, which is the buffer that looked more promising on those gross, if you want, initial screens. When you take a look at the size distribution, you can see that is actually performing much, much better. In DLS, it was exactly the same thing. And you can see the cumulant PDIs on the buffer A are selected candidate versus the original candidate. Um, whether before, before they were actually pretty similar, whereas after the ultrafiltration, it changes pretty much. So essentially, we realized, or we concluded that aggregation is final formulation dependent. And even though a little bit lower melting temperature is seen for AV in the final formulation buffer A, we didn't see any aggregation and the change in melting temperatures is not that, that big if you take a look at the nano DSF data. So essentially, we chose to continue with the uh, final formulation for A. And then we went to sterile filtration of those products that we have um, formulated. And you can see here the overlay of the product before and after sterile filtration in DLS, a perfect match there with the cumulant PDIs and the radiuses. And just to show the comparison, here are the, the TFF products before sterile filtration and uh, on the two buffers and you can see here the large order aggregates that are seen in the in our original problematic buffer let's say and then the sterile final uh, products where basically you still can see that even after sterile filtration you can actually gain some higher order uh, aggregates in your sample even after sterile filtration, whereas it doesn't happen on the on the buffer that we eventually ended up selecting. So altogether, final formulation I A confirmed as the best candidate, and um, a little bit now for the process analytics itself. So how did that help to improve our process? But you can see here, essentially these are the signals that they come from. Uh, Panta instrument, and you would have either your loads for these are in duplicate, either your loads for the both runs, the dye filtration, different samples at different dye volumes. 
with your TFF2 product and the sterile filter product in red. And as you can see there, basically the signal drops enormously in the on the original buffer that we were working with. And that was uh, responsible for the losses that are seen in the in the table above. Where you can see the in based on either DDPC, DDPCR, so barrel genomes per ml. And also what we have been trying to do is to use actually Panta signal, the 330 nanometer signal, uh, in order to use it as a quick uh, titrin uh, for these samples. And actually, if the samples are of good quality and you don't have aggregates, it's surprisingly near what you can obtain, whereas a lot of differences or larger differences can be seen once you have aggregation. But uh, the recoveries that we obtain, as you can see, well, with the variability of the techniques, but essentially 100% recovery in sterile filtration once formulating in the proper buffer, whereas the original enormous losses that we were facing at the beginning uh, with the wrong buffer. So essentially, aggregation has been uh, solved, the problem that we have with aggregation. And now what we are focusing is in further optimization of the of the ultra filtration, the TFF step itself, in order to gain higher concentrations at the end of the drop product. And now it's basically just the optimization of the process step without considering whether the buffer has any impact or not there. Uh, finally, for the stability of the final of the of the drug products that we obtained there, we stored we store them at different conditions for up to 24 hours. We still have experiments ongoing for longer storage periods. Uh, freeze and thaw, what is the effect of that in samples, different thawing methods whether it's slow or fast thawing, some buffers may be prone to um, pH shifts and, and that could lead to trouble. But as you can see, the nano DSF signals, perfect overlay there and the same is true for the DLS on all the different conditions. So pretty happy with the, with the results that we are obtaining. And uh, it, was, it was very fast actually to reach to the stage where we did and the effort and money that we dedicated to it was just a fraction of what would be needed if we had to go without the help of uh, Prometheus Panta and that technology. As a conclusion, uh, for final drug product characterization, obviously Prometheus Panta is one of the additions that we have to the regular other techniques. Um, but we are looking into orthogonality and uh, size exclusion, multi-angle light scattering, analytical ultracentrifugation, asymmetric flow, field flow, fractionation. This is something that we are looking with collaborators also for <laughs> for description of or comparison of, uh, of batches and potency assays. So this is part of the <clears throat> additional techniques that we use for uh, characterization and determining critical quality attributes. And altogether, accelerated buffer studies using the technology that Nanotemper created has helped us to work in a very fast manner with AV and AD, so adenoviruses, in process development. Not only to solve problems in the case of adenovirus aggregation, for example, is not an issue, but when going to different uh, targets or different approaches for formulation, this is a really uh, fast way to do it. And as I said, excludes very quickly no-go candidates, and that is and that is a real benefit. So finally, we are using currently the technique itself as a very easy in-process quality control during our viral vector purifications and productions at scale to see that um, sizes or aggregation or the melting temperatures are not different from batch to batch. So altogether pretty happy with with the technology that we introduced in KCT uh, with uh, the help of uh, nanotemper. And with that I'll leave it there and 
If anybody interested on contacting us, please do so. We are really keen on collaborating with people and organizations uh, to bring this field further. Thank you very much.